<laughs> Hello, I'm Lance Humphreys. I'm the executive director of the Mount Vernon Place Conservancy. Welcome to Flower Mart. Our friends at the National Aquarium are going to walk you through how to download an app on your smartphone that allows you to identify plants in your yard or garden. The images you gather create data used by scientists to understand the diversity of wildlife in our city. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. This is David Bergen. I'm a guest engagement specialist at the National Aquarium. It's wonderful to be here. I'm glad that you're all logged on with us this afternoon. Uh, without further ado, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so our topic today is we're talking about community science, uh, a topic that I'm really excited to be talking about myself, a way that we can get nerdy with nature and bring science right into our backyards. Uh, so we'll start today by defining community science. It's the collection and analysis of data relating to the natural world by members of the general public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. Uh, that seems pretty straightforward. So we'll touch next on sort of the who, what, when, where, why questions that you might have surrounding the concept. Uh, so the philosophy behind community science is a rather simple one. Uh, science just needs more eyes, ears, and perspectives than any one scientist has. And that's where volunteers like us can play a significant role in the scientific process. Now, formerly known as citizen science, community science is an inclusive endeavor that aims to grow partnerships and participation, engaging not just individuals, but entire communities as well. Um, during normal times, large community science events hope to bring together people as a caring community who care about and are inspired by the protection of our natural world. Now you might be wondering why community science is important. Community science helps to expose and involve a larger community in the scientific process, grow or reinforce the value of scientific research as a component of conservation, gather like-minded individuals and foster a sense of community, and to collect and analyze scientific data for use by professional scientists, of course. So, moving on. Uh, community science works in a number of ways, but these are really the key points, are that number one, anyone can participate. Doesn't really matter where you live, what you're, science, what you're into, uh, there's definitely something out there for you. Uh, within a project, participants are asked to use the same protocols so data can easily be combined and also for quality assurance purposes, of course. Uh, data helps real scientists reach conclusions that have real world applications. And a wide community of scientists and volunteers work together and share data that scientists and the public can access. Now, another big question surrounding community science is where can I find community science projects? Uh, and really looking through things, at least especially on the uh, the, pro the site that I'm sharing with you now, it's called SciStarter. There's a really wide variety of projects. Uh, a couple of ones that I found interesting as I browse through, you can observe clouds for NASA. You can... Uh, join one called Tree Snap, which is locating sightings of endangered or threatened tree species. Or you could do something relatively simple, but also local, uh, such as a pollinator study, something like that. Um, there's pretty much as many projects as you can think of, there's going to be something out there for you to join uh, and participate in. So there are quite a few community science projects going on out there. SciStarter is probably the most comprehensive database of them that I found. Uh, so I thought I would share that resource with everybody. And that encompasses not only large national or international projects on there, but also something as uh, local as the city or community level. Um, so there's really lots of things that you can participate in no matter where you're at. Now next we'll move into what Lance had sort of introduced in the start, which is iNaturalist. 
uh, one of my favorite community science apps, and in fact, one of the most popular community science apps in the entire world. Uh, so starting off, what is iNaturalist? Essentially, it's a place to record and organize nature findings, meet other nature enthusiasts, and learn more about the natural world. It encourages the participation of a wide variety of nature enthusiasts, including, but not exclusive to, hikers, backpackers, birders, beachcombers, foragers, park rangers, ecologists, and fishermen, as well as many, many others. Now, through connecting these different perceptions and expertise of the natural world, iNaturalist is hoping to create an extensive community awareness of local biodiversity, and they're hoping to promote further exploration of local environments. Uh, as you can see there, there's more than a million registered users currently and more than 66 million observations worldwide. And one of my favorite aspects about it is that it's available in 37 different languages right now, uh, sort of building the inclusivity that the environmental movement is really based off of. Now, this began in 2008, actually, as a master's project of a couple of three students at the at Cal Berkeley School of Information. Uh, in 2014, it became an initiative of the California Academy of Sciences, and then it was a became a joint initiative with the National Geographic Society in 2017. So they really have picked up a lot of traction through the years and built up some really important partnerships as well. Now, you might be asking, why is iNaturalist important to community science? Really, iNaturalist contributes a large global data set that's free, accessible, and widely used for research. Uh, it can also help influence policy as well, but we'll touch on that a little bit later on. Now, to start with, you should probably know how to use iNaturalist if we're going to be using it in the first place. Um, so there's really a couple of different ways Obviously, on your phone or your tablet is a great way to start uh, by going to either the Google Play Store or that App Store on your iPad or iPhone. Uh, and once downloading, you can actually begin observing right away. And with that in mind, I did create a short little tutorial here. So assuming you've already got iNaturalist app open on your phone or tablet, all you have to do is start by taking a picture. So let's see. Let's say you see an animal out there in your travels or maybe even in your backyard as you're looking out the, out, the, out the back window. All you really have to do is open that iNaturalist app and take a picture of that animal. And after your photos have a sort of a clear perspective with the animal in focus, you'll proceed to that next screen shown right here. Uh, in that screen, probably the, the, I've sort of highlighted the, some of the more important things there with those little blue arrows, the time and the date, as well as the location stamp. Those are gonna be helpful things right from the right off the bat. Uh, but you'll also notice there's a couple of other uh, a couple other options that you can fill out there as well, tabs to explore. Uh, down at the bottom is also projects. If you're joining, if you've joined any particular projects or if there's any projects you'd like to contribute your observations to, that's a good place to do that. Uh, but there's also going to be a suggestion box right there, that little helpful red square of ours. Um, so once you've taken a picture of the animal and made sure all of your data things are nice and set and accurate, um, you'll go into the what did you see and you can view the suggestions. If you know what you've seen, you can actually look up the species by name, which I find to be really helpful um, because sometimes the iNaturalist um, suggestions are not quite as thorough or not quite as exact as you'd want them to be. Like you can see there, we can tell that that's a rock pigeon. Um, but the first thing that the, that, I, that the iNaturalist app popped up with was old world pigeons. So you can be more specific if you'd like to. Um, but essentially after you've made your identification or if you don't have, if you're not quite sure what you're exactly looking at, um, those suggestions will be helpful, but then the community will come in later and the iNaturalist community will help you better identify that animal or if you've identified it all the way down to that species level in the taxonomy, they will help you to confirm what you've already identified 
Uh, and in fact, after a f usually at least one other person in the community has uh, confirmed the identification that you've already made, your picture, depending on its quality, may actually make it to the research grade level, in which case scientists will be able to use that observation in their research. And it's a very helpful way to, to contribute. Now, you might be thinking, okay, this is just an app, but there is also a website that has a slightly more immersive experience. Um, on the web page, a little bit different from the app itself. You can register or log in to your account, upload your observations, make those IDs, of course. But you can also explore local or explore other observations that have been made by the community. Um, you can filter those by location, species, or even the observer or identifier. Uh, if you happen to know other folks who do use the uh, use the app or are just in the, com in the iNaturals community in general, it's a really great way to take a look at what they've seen. Um, a couple of our coworkers here at the National Aquarium are actually very active in the iNaturals community. So I stake out their pages every so often just to see what kind of cool animals they've seen around the aquarium. Now, the species exploration is perhaps the most immersive portion of that website. Um, it offers information about obviously location, but also taxonomy, conservation status, as well as similar species that you might have seen, uh, in addition to information about that species itself, which is a pretty neat way to start, uh, as not only interact with others, but also to learn more while you do so. Uh, and I know this is a question that may come up, um, as with many apps and things related to the internet, and especially social media, privacy is definitely a priority. With iNaturalist, there are options to obscure your location data and to limit what information that you're sharing with others, of course. Now, surprisingly, there actually is a secondary app by iNaturalist called Seek. Uh, Seek is well, actually, another, my second favorite nature app, because I just happened to have discovered it after I discovered iNaturalist. But Seek is essentially a natural history and exploration app, just like iNaturalist, but it's geared more towards exploration and learning than community science data collection. Uh, Seek is an excellent learning resource for new learners and those with a budding interest in the natural world. Uh, but the way that uh, the way that identifications and observations are made, that's one of the main differences between the two, but they are both very, very helpful, very interesting apps to use. I'd I recommend personally downloading both of them. Now we'll move on to how to use Seek. Um, so to identify thing, living things using Seek, because obviously we're here at Flower Mart, so we want to be identifying plants, but also animals. You could identify uh, animals, plants, fungi, all sorts of different living things using either of the two apps. Um, but to use Seek, all you really have to do is open the Seek app, open that camera function on the app and point it at a living thing and then Seek gets to work. Uh, that seems probably a little bit too good to be true, um, but I did collect a couple more screenshots available here for you so that we could sort of walk through how this thing works exactly. Uh, so the other day I was out on a hike and I saw a relatively familiar looking plant, a fern, but I wasn't exactly sure of the species. There, but fortunately I had my phone with me and I opened up Seek and opened that camera function and you point it at the living thing for long enough and usually just a couple of seconds and it actually pops up sometimes all the way down to the species level. Now you can see these nice little green dots there inside of that little helpful red box again. Those dots are helpful, but they actually do tell you a little bit about how well Seek is identifying that particular organism. Um, each of those little dots refers to a taxonomic rank. Um, so for those of you who remember grade school or high school, um, you might remember the King Philip came over for good soup in a way, the, the way that you, the mnemonic device you can use to remember um, kingdom phylum all the way down to the genus and species level. Um, so those little dots, each of those represents a, 
identification at that particular level. So for this, it's a Christmas fern, which I didn't know. I could have told you it was a fern, but not a Christmas fern. Um, so Seek is a really helpful app in doing the identification legwork for you. But then it also brings up uh, information about how to either number one, better identify that. Let's say this is actually my on my first attempt. I didn't do a great job of getting the entire the entire fern in the frame. Um, so Seek will try to identify it as far down as it can, and then it'll come up with a suggestion of what it believes it might be, or it will identify it all the way down to that species level, and you'll get a little bit more information actually linked from the Wikipedia page about that particular species. But of course, just like iNaturalist, it has the spillover of all these other species that may be related or may be found nearby too. So it really is an excellent app for those who are just starting off in that learning process. So as you can see, I just sort of listed the differences there between iNaturalist and Seek. Um, obviously, Seek a, a little bit less of an online community like iNaturalist is, um, where iNaturalist is sort of the best choice if you want to be collecting that community science data that scientists are actually going to be using. Uh, also, was targeted toward a slightly older age group. Users have to be over the age of 13 to create an account. Um, and the ID models are, as, as we mentioned, a little bit different, um, but definitely both have their, they both have their places. Um, when I'm very confident of what a particular species is, I will open Seek just to see if I'm right. And then actually on Seek at the bottom, after you've made your observation, you can post it straight to iNaturalist, where the community will then go that one step further, verifying what you've already uh, identified. And then you'll be able to share that with scientists. So you're still giving them that collected data. Um, so both of them working in conjunction, being made by the same people, thankfully, is a really, a really nice tandem. Now, I'm talking about all of this, not just because I love them and because they're really excellent apps that you can use and connect to the world in a slightly different way and a slightly more immersive and educational way, but it's also to get you ready for the City Nature Challenge, which actually began yesterday, but runs through the end of the weekend. So the City Nature Challenge is an annual global science competition to document urban biodiversity. Uh, the challenge is a bio blitz that engages city residents and visitors to discover and document plants, animals, and other living things in their cities. Uh, and for a little bit of pause for a little bit of a definition here, a bio blitz, all that means it's an intent in 2016 uh, when the community science teams at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and the California Academy of Sciences created the City Nature Challenge as a way to capitalize on the friendly rivalry between LA and San Francisco. Um, but as you can see in the numbers there, this, if this annual event has really taken off over the past few years. Um, they went from two cities in 2016 to over 200 last year, despite the pandemic. Um, obviously, normally it's held in a competition style format, but last year, because of COVID, they stopped doing the uh, competition portion of it and just made it an overall sort of an all-inclusive collective, how many cities, how many observations, how many species are we able to document, but also how many people are we able to engage and get them to participate in all of this. Uh, now, and Baltimore has been officially involved in the City Nature Challenge the past three years. Um, we've grown from about almost 6,000 observations in 2018 and just under 1,000 species to over 10,000, almost 11,000 observations last year, 1,500 species and over 600 participants. Uh, and in the time that Baltimore alone has been doing this, there have been over 300 species that were not previously documented on iNaturalist added to the larger overall data set. So even right here in a big city, we're able to 
show things and document things that really weren't there in the first place. So there's still things to discover out there, even though we may think and we sometimes we may feel like we're not as connected to nature as we would like to be. And you might be thinking this all sounds fun and good and a good way to get to know the local habitats better, but how am I helping? That's a valid point. Um, we don't really tend to think of competitions that are just for fun as scientifically helpful, uh, but your observations, like I mentioned, could help scientists learn more about not only the health and population trends of local species, but let's say if you were to observe a vulnerable or endangered species in a previously unknown area, that could help with local, state, or federal protection of that ecosystem. Uh, theoretically, you participating in this just for fun nature competition could lead to better protection and preservation of the ecosystems around you, uh, which to me goes way beyond anything that I could hope to achieve in my day job. And I get paid to talk about animals and nature all day long. <laughs> and those three plants up there on the screen with you right now, those are actually three endangered or vulnerable species that live right here in Maryland um, that have been documented on iNaturalist. In Total over uh, actually 73 different spe threatened species in Maryland have been identified on iNaturalist, and over 2,000 different plant species have been identified in the state already. Uh, but we're still at hoping to add some more. Now, I mentioned that this is the city nature challenge, and that might make you feel a little bit excluded because you might not live within city limits, but that's okay. As you can see by that map there, the National Aquarium is the regional coordinator for this year's City Nature Challenge for the entire Baltimore area. And it's not just Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Anne Arundel County, Howard County, Carroll County, Harford County, and Queen Anne's County. All of those are involved in our regional data set this year. So we're expanded a little bit outside of the Baltimore area, truly, but that means that we can engage a much larger audience around this City Nature Challenge this year. Now, as you can see uh, on the right side there, observations did open yesterday, but they last through May 3rd. So there's still a number of days to get out there and observe and collect that data. And then May 4th through 9th, which is next week, you will be helping, you can help identify the species that were observed. And then on May 10th is when the City Nature Challenge results are announced. Uh, in 2019, Baltimore placed 35th in observations, 31st in species identified and observed, and 23rd in participants. But uh, which is not not too shabby, especially for uh, especially for the second year that we were in the competition. But I think this year we can do a little bit better, especially because we've got number one, such a, a much larger group there. But also number two, we've got all of you on here today learning more about this as well. Now, I know we're here at Flower Mart, so I won't get into just citizen or I'm sorry, community science, but we'll also give something for those uh, all those green thumbs out there, which I hope there are some here today, because if not now, when, right? Um, but there's other ways to connect with nature, such as getting a Master Gardener certification and volunteering your botanical knowledge and expertise. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, Master Gardeners are volunteers who serve as a resource for urban horticulture and gardening advice for their communities, sharing their extensive knowledge with the public through phone or email helplines, speaking at public events, writing articles, and partnering with community programs, gardens, or educational organizations too. Uh, and there are master gardeners active in all 50 states and eight Canadian provinces out there. Uh, so this is something that is active across our country, which is very helpful. Um, here in Maryland, anyone can be anyone over the age of 18 can be a master gardener. Um, it helps if you like working with people and plants, of course, uh, but also helps if you've got a passion for learning more about the natural world and then sharing that expertise and knowledge as well. Now, why be a master gardener? There's, as you can see, there's a number of points there, but essentially a master gardener is a resource for their community. Uh, they're helping to expand their own knowledge and educate others, but all the while they're also getting to do something that they love. 
uh, which I don't think these days can be understated with all the hopefully new hobbies that you've picked up. Hopefully you've delved further into the things that you love. And for those of you who are the who are green thumbs out there, this is a way to get even further into your hobby and uh, connect with others who share that same interest as well. Now that brings us to the how to get certified as a master gardener, which is a four step certification process here in the state of Maryland. Um, Essentially, you'd have to determine where you're, where you have your Master Gardener basic training, uh, which is either hosted by your city or your county. Um, you contact the Master Gardener coordinator for your either your city or your county uh, to receive your application package. You'd attend those basic training classes and pass a final exam. And then after you've completed those, you'll complete at least 40 hours of approved volunteer service, which goes by quicker than you might imagine. So that's one other way that you can help to connect with nature a little bit better. But there's also a couple of others. Um, I know this is one that's in, the next one is, is something that it has interested me as well. And that is certifying your yard for wildlife. And it's actually a program through the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, and it sounds very official, but it's a little bit more simple than you might think. Uh, so a certified wildlife habitat Essentially, it meets the basic needs of animals in your area so that they can live, but also so that they can thrive. Um, so that's gonna include number one, food, native plants and feeders as supplemental food resources, water, obviously all animals need water to survive, um, some, but some need it for bathing and cleaning, but also for breeding as well. Um, cover or areas for wildlife to shelter. Uh, that's that one's fairly self-explanatory um, areas to take cover from the weather to take cover from predators or from prey um, and then of course places for wildlife to raise their young as well uh, not only to reproduce but just to protect and nourish them and then also sustainable practices uh, maintaining that habitat in a natural way that ensures that air water and soil quality are all clean and healthy but in a way that is natural and conducive to the survival of those animals out there. So how do you get certified? Again, some people see that National Wildlife Federation tag on there and they get a little bit apprehensive, but it is easier than you think. Um, they just, you would assess your habitat looking for multiple foods, multiple food sources, multiple sources of water, multiple places of cover, places to raise young, and those sustainable practices. Uh, and you'd go to the NWF website, nwf.org, nice and easy there, and search for certify or find the certify a garden link in one of their drop down menus and you'd simply apply. Uh, and then, or if and when you get that habitat certified, you'll actually have the option to have a NWF sign just like this one here. You can put up and help designate that habitat hopefully educating others or even enticing others to certify their own habitats as well. Uh, and that's a, a, nice, a nice sort of more passive way than master gardening to become a bit more involved and a bit uh, more close to nature as well. And those certified wildlife habitats are really helpful because the really the rapid large scale changes to our lands and water mean that wildlife are sort of losing their habitats as they once knew them. But every habitat that we are certifying is a step towards replenishing those resources for wildlife, such as your pollinators, but also birds and amphibians. Uh, and they're helpful not only locally, but especially along migratory corridors, just like the state of Maryland over the next, I would say the next month or two here, we are gonna see a ton of migratory birds coming up from the south as they make their way up north for the winter, or I'm sorry, for the summer breeding season. Uh, so we're a really, a key area in terms of not only obviously local, but, all, but also those migratory corridors as well. So certifying your habitat for wildlife is a really simple, but a really helpful way to help out as well. Uh, so those were just a few of the ways that each and every one of us can get nerdy with nature and bring community science as well as nature itself a little closer to us. Uh, now I hope I addressed everyone, or I hope I addressed all the topics sufficiently, um, 
but just to make sure that I did so, do we have any questions at this time? Hi, everybody. I'm just reading through the chat here. Um, so our first question, what about trees planted by the city or potted plants? That is an excellent question. Uh, thank you for that one, Jesse. Um, so as long as you don't have, for the city, for the purposes of the City Nature Challenge, as long as you don't have a bunch of observations of cultivated plants, they should be counted towards the City Nature Challenge. Uh, however, it's important to mark those when you make them in iNaturalist as cultivated. Um, there actually is a drop down section of iNaturalist that will allow you to list whether that that organism that you're observing, usually a plant, is cultivated or not. Um, so that's a really simple way to sort of determine, but it also helps with the data sets as well for that community science data gathering. Uh, excellent question. Next question. Uh, do I have to subscribe to the City Nature Challenge in order to share my pictures? Another excellent question. Uh, you do not have to join the City Nature Challenge in order to share your photos. Um, all observations that are made within the boundary of the, uh, of the project between April 30th and May 3rd will automatically get pulled into the project. So you don't need to add your observations to the project. Um, you're welcome to, of course, uh, but you don't have to. Um, another question, do I have to share my data location? No, you don't have to share your data location and iNaturalist does give you the ability to obscure your data location if you so choose. Um, for those threatened or endangered species, iNaturalist is actually automatically going to obscure that data as well so that, they're, so that they are doing their due diligence and protecting those vulnerable and those endangered species as well. Alrighty, so I don't think we've got any more questions. Um, so to wrap things up, we're going to show you an official City Nature Challenge video that will hopefully pump you up and get you excited for making those observations and those identifications over the next few days. Uh, so without further ado, here we go. Welcome to the 2021 City Nature Challenge. Now more than ever, we need to study nature in cities around the globe. We can't fully protect nature on this planet without studying what is living in cities. Help us by joining the over 350 cities worldwide as some compete and some collaborate to see how many wildlife observations we can gather together. Using cameras and smartphones, tens of thousands of people will take pictures or record sounds of wildlife in their home cities, all contributing to an international database of urban wildlife that will be used by scientists and naturalists to help understand nature in our cities and work to make them better places for humans and wildlife to live. Just imagine how many observations we can make, all working together. Go to citynaturechallenge.org to see if you're in one of the cities taking part between April 30th and May 3rd. Then take pictures of wildlife and upload them to our global database using iNaturalist or your city's preferred platform. Watch as experts all over the world help to identify your observations. Join the 2021 City Nature Challenge or follow along and see how we work together to change the world. Alrighty, so I hope that got you excited. Uh, hopefully you're as excited as I am for the City Nature Challenge this year. And uh, before I say goodbye, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today. Um, and I hope I was able to show you a new way to connect with nature today. Um, I'd also like to thank you again for logging on. I hope I see you out there this weekend for the City Nature Challenge. And hopefully someday in the future, I'll see you in person here at the National Aquarium. Bye, everybody.